three quarters away from the basket. Throws it, it goes in, but it was still in his hand when it hit zero. It had it been maybe two tenths of a second. Church, does anyone have any announcements this morning? I just want uh, people to know that we are now in Lent, and I have some Lenten devotionals back on the uh, on the back table. So please feel free to take one along with you. Um, are there any other announcements? Well, I have an announcement. I know this is disappointing for you. I know you were looking forward to me leading the singing with my dulcet tones. But unfortunately, plans have changed and Connie showed up. <laughs> so I guess Connie will lead the singing. You'll just have to wait till the next time she's not here. Next week. Next week. <laughs> Let us center ourselves for worship. Will you please rise, if you are able, and join me in the call to worship. Happy are those whose sins are forgiven. Happy are those whose sins are passed away. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice. Sing songs of joy unto the Lord. Rejoice the Lord. Amen. Will you please join Connie and Marge in our opening hymn, Lord, who throughout these 40 days found in your hymnal number 269.
Holy One, we are constantly bombarded with temptations and enticements. When we yield, when we fail, who will help us? You, Lord, have come to our aid. You teach us, counsel us, and guide us in the ways we should go. We rejoice in your unfailing love. In the hour of his temptation, when Jesus hungered, he knew from where his sustenance came. One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Lord, from the abundance of your grace, your word has provided all that we need. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and can be found in the insert in your bulletin. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You may eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. This is the word of God. Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Let us now offer one another a sign of peace. Now is the time for our sharing of joys and concerns. Does anyone have any joys that they wish to share? Life is a joy. All the time. And all the time? God is good. Are there other joys? How about concerns? I have two, unfortunately. I just found out this week um, that my uncle Bill, who I shared with birthday with, um, he was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer just before Christmas. Um, he's in good hands with my aunt, who is a great advocate. Um, so we keep faith in that. And it's supposedly still growing, so that's um, and then my husband's sister um, was admitted to 
Potsdam Hospital, she had a mass that she went in for a biopsy, I think, Wednesday. And we're awaiting the results. Um, from what we know, it's scary. Um, but she is being very optimistic. And um, she's a retired paramedic from over 40 years, so she knows what's going on. Um, so we're keeping faith that uh, it's, we don't know if it's definitely only in the what stage, but we're hoping for the best outcome. Other concerns? Um, continue prayers for my friend Patty. Um, and she, um, I put her on a prayer chain last week. She had um, diverticulosis and it perforated her bowels. So she has infection and they're working on getting that under control. So. There was a gentleman who works for me. I'll call him Craig. He came into work one. Actually, no. He texted me at 8 o'clock at night. He was upset. His father had fallen and cut his leg. He was in the hospital. I think it was Holy Redeemer. And he was in Holy Redeemer. And when he went to visit him, his father did not recognize him, but thought he was his brother who died back in 1993. The father also did not recognize his wife. They did an MRI and an EEG and you know all the scans, and they sent him to St. Mary's Hospital. And he had texted me that he was worried about this about his dad. And I told him to let the doctors do what they do, and that I would be praying for him. He came into, this was on Tuesday. So in my routine, I get up at 5, 10 in the morning, I go downstairs, I sit in my dining room, mommy, my living room, in a chair that looks out a picture window where I can see the sunrise. And I say <laughs> my prayers. On Friday, he came in and said, your dad's fine. He remembers everybody. He knows everything. So, you know, when we do the sharing of joys and concerns, and we put people on the prayer list, and I know it doesn't always work out the way that we want it to. That's why it's thy kingdom come, thy will be done, not thy kingdom come, Bob's will be done. Um, but prayer is helpful. It helped calm him down, knowing that people were praying for him. And... It's okay in this place if you have a concern or something you want us to pray for. It's okay to let us know. It's okay to put it on the, on the prayer list that I think Carol's keeping right there by herself. Right? Yeah, you got the clipboard. So don't hesitate to do that. Are there other concerns? younger sister who is in a, um, a group home. She's been in a group home for about 10 years or so uh, in Philadelphia. Um, she, she, she has Down syndrome. She has now moved into pretty um, significant dementia. And um, he did get a call last night that um, she was um, she needed, she needed to um, have some morphine uh, provided. So we're waiting to hear what the outcome of that was. But clearly, she's, she's moving toward um, end of life. Her name is Lois. Lois? Lois. Other concerns? Um, 
I went to visit my aunt Eleanor, and she's showing great uh, in Shandy Manor. She's showing great uh, mental decline as well. But she's going to be 104 in June, so. Oh, no, I don't know. But it's uh, it's sad to see. Yeah. I've been showing mental decline since I was four. <laughs> she's 104. Wow. Yeah, almost. Yep. Other concerns? That's one of the beauties of things like, and I'm still going to call it the wrong name, Aid for Friends. The little things that you do, the little meals that you do, they help tremendously. Other concerns? Then let us pray. Lord, we are so very grateful for, for the gift of life. And we are grateful for you and your love that you share with us. And we pray today for all those people that are suffering, especially for Uncle Bill. We pray that the doctors and nurses have the knowledge to treat him, to bring him back home, or to have him have a peaceful time until he joins you. We pray for all those with illnesses and tumors and masses and all those that have had testing and are anxiously awaiting those results. We pray that you lay your calming hand upon them. We pray for Patty, who's recovering from an illness, and for Wayne's younger sister Lois, and for all people with dementia, Down syndrome, or any kind of mental problem. And we pray for those who are moving towards the end of life. Help them to not be fearful. Let them feel the love of your son, Jesus Christ, as they move to a conclusion that is just an end at one point and a beginning at another. And we pray for Aunt Eleanor, who's 104. We pray that she has a happy, healthy, life for the rest of her life until such time as she joins you. And we pray today especially for the poor, for they were near and dear to your heart, for those that were getting benefits that would help them feed their families. And we pray that those that make the decisions regarding funding realize the impact of what they're doing. And we pray that as churches and Christians and people, your people, we are able to fill in the gaps to help these people survive. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. And we praise you and worship you by reciting the words that your Son taught us, stating, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please join Connie and Marge in our next hymn, Be Still My Soul, found in your hymnal, number 534.
Our gospel reading this morning is from the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, and can be found in the insert in your bulletin. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. He fasted forty days and forty nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. <coughs> Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Well, good morning again. As previously stated, my name is Bob Irving, and it is a joy to serve as the pastor here at Solberry United Methodist Church. And you're actually in for a treat, because normally my sermon notes are four pages long, and today they're only two pages. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, and I must admit, I have strayed from my Catholic roots. I even ate a hamburger on Friday. But let me explain a little. Growing up, I was raised as a Catholic. During Lent, you were always taught that you gave up something, and you never ate meat on a Friday. You could eat fish, but you could not eat beef. You could not eat pork. And as a boy, this was one of the worst times of the year for me. And here's why. I never understood why I had to give up chocolate. <laughs> because it was never explained to me. The rationale behind giving something up was not explained to me. And I don't know, there are, there are some people of other Christian denominations that give something up, but maybe you gave something up for Lent. I don't know that. I gave up cigarettes, but then I don't smoke, so that was kind of easy for me to do. But this is something that a lot of Christians do. And I don't know if a lot of Christians know why they do it. They may have ideas but I'm not sure that they know. The other thing that I wanted to mention before I go on was I am constantly amazed. I read this much of the Bible, two, three, four paragraphs, whatever it is, and the amount of stuff that is contained in that small section is mind-blowing. You could never get to all the meanings that are deep within a four-paragraph passage of the Bible. Please pray with me. Lord, as we sit here and worship and listen to your word, give us ears to hear and a mind to understand. Help us become better disciples. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, you guys have heard the story of my dad and his stereo. The sermon title, Whipped Cream and Other Delights, with apologies to Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass, comes from one of the albums that he would play. He had a great collection of music. But that album cover for a young boy 
was temptation. And I'll explain that a little bit later. Genesis. Everyone knows the story of Adam and Eve. Pretty much everyone. And I find it interesting that one of the things that preachers never talk about, they never talk about the fact that the serpent approached the, the woman and not the man. And some, some ministers I've actually heard blame females for our fall from grace because she gave something to Adam. Guess what? It doesn't say he protested. It doesn't say he threw it away. It doesn't say he said, ooh, I'm going to tell God you're in trouble. Right? And that whole concept of when you eat from that, you will die. We take as you will die right now, as if you ate a poison apple. But what he is saying in you will die is that you will become just like the animals of the earth. And you will suffer throughout your life. And in the end, you will die. And I also found it interesting that Adam, if you, if you look back at the Genesis passage, God created Adam to till the garden. He was to care for the garden. And God created Eve because none of the animals that he created were a, a suitable partner for Adam. Now, we all know the story. Here's the funny thing. We have all in our lives lived the story. There's a lot of things that go on in our brains. Things do and don't do. Don't do that. Do this. We have in our heads a basic knowledge of what is right and what is wrong. We have a basic knowledge of what is good and what is bad. The serpent in this story represents something. And God's word represents something. Notice God does talk to them. God's word represents the word that we're supposed to follow. And we know the word is Jesus. The serpent represents temptation. And when we swing over to Matthew, I'm sure this is the first time you heard this story in Matthew, right? About the devil tempting Jesus? Well, the devil tempts Jesus, yes. <clears throat> but the temptations are different. The devil is trying to get Jesus to do something that violates Scripture. And Jesus combats the devil utilizing Scripture. I don't know if I'd ever get into a scriptural debate with, with Jesus Christ, because I don't think I would win. But clearly the devil thought he was going to win. And why do you think the devil was doing that thing? It's because Jesus represents the downfall, the ultimate downfall of the devil. You see, it's funny, because even the demons, all of uh, Satan and all of his little minions, even they know Scripture. And the devil likes to skew things. He takes things and he skews them. He kind of rearranges some of the words just so that people will fall into his trap. You will not surely die. 
Did he have foreknowledge? Did he have foreknowledge that the death that God was speaking about was not immediate death? But enough about the devil. What does this mean for us? Well, you see, the devil in modern day, he does not have a horn and a red tail and a pitchfork. I'm pretty sure that if somebody appeared in front of you and he was red and he had a tail with an arrow on the end and a pitchfork and horns, that anything he said to you, say, no, 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 I'm not doing what you say, Mr. Devil. He does not appear that way. I remember one Halloween when my son was very young. We went trick-or-treating. And we walk out of the house and he was dressed as the devil. The caricature devil. We went to the Segrew's house right next door, trick-or-treat, got candy, don't you look nice. Then we went to the next house and then that next house was a couple that they did not have children. They were younger than us, but she was from the south, right? So he knocks on the door, and Michaela's the, I think Michaela was a princess. Knocks on the door, and she goes, oh, what a beautiful princess. And you, y'all must be the devil. And my son looks up at the lady and says straight-faced, oh, no, I'm the devil's son, and that makes him Way to go, Andy. I can't wait for his wedding so I can tell that story. I want to get back to that album cover for a minute. On that album cover, there's a woman who appears to be naked, covered in whipped cream, showing an ample amount of bosom. And for a young boy that really is just starting to learn about girls, it's a fascinating album cover. It really is. But here's the thing. I had never seen anything with that kind of sexual content in it. Because back then, there were some strict rules about what was shown on television, about what was shown in advertisements and commercials. There was a lot of strict rules. And there were heavy fines for violations. Do you remember the old thing about the, the subliminal messaging in print advertisement? Where like, you know, a glass of soda or whatever with ice cubes in it, and if you looked at the ice cubes, they spelled out the word sex. Or there was uh, a picture of a, of a naked woman that you could barely perceive. And then on television advertisements, they would slip in one or two frames that were would register in your head, but you wouldn't see it to try to get you to buy their product. You see, the devil nowadays comes to us in images, in marketing, in advertisements, in fear. How many people in here watch the news? I do not watch the news. Do you know why I do not watch the news? because the news is focused on fear. Crime rate in Philadelphia. Fentanyl coming over the border, killing our children. Suicides among children who have, all right. You know, there's always been people that overdose on drugs. And there's always going to be people that overdose on drugs. Yes, it's a new drug. Yes, it's fatal. Yes, yes, yes. There's always children that have committed suicide, as tragic as that is. There's always children that go astray. There's always people that go astray and kill other people. There's always somebody looking for something to try to make money, like stealing a catalytic converter. That will always happen. As a matter of fact, do you know what the biggest problems in New York City were in the 1870s? The biggest problems were pollution, drug addiction, and crime. Those were the biggest problems. 
You know what the biggest problems are in New York City in the year 2022? Pollution, drug addiction, crime. Nothing changed. And the news is just a way to fill your head to be afraid to go to the city at night and have dinner. Why would you? You're less likely to be killed in Newtown than you are in Philadelphia. They're all distractions. They're all distractions, and I, I know this is going to sound like a Southern Baptist preacher, but these things are all of evil. They're all things that are designed to keep you from doing the things that you should do. And as Christians, I have to applaud this group because you guys do a lot of things in spite of what's going on. For a small group of people, you make a phenomenal contribution to the community. But in 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, verse 13, Paul writes, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You see, evil does not need you to sin. It only needs you to be distracted. Because when you're distracted, you don't listen to that little voice that tells you what to do. When you're fearful, you don't listen to that little voice that tells you what to do. And that little <coughs> excuse me. And that little voice happens to come from God. This is the way it has always been. Only now we're more inundated with stuff. Do you know that if a sheep herder gets killed in a landslide in New Zealand, CNN is going to have a reporter there talking to the sheep. How do you feel about your shepherd being killed in a landslide? Right? And they'll talk about how all these sheep no longer have anybody to care for them. What a tragedy. And someone will start a GoFundMe page for the sheep. You see, Paul tells us also to put on the armor of God. Where do we find the armor of God? It's in our closet. It's in our scripture. Our scripture is our closet for the armor of God. So during Lent, we need to focus on the enormity of our responsibility as Christians to stay focused, to not be distracted, to combat evil and temptation in our own lives and the lives of the ones that we love. And the reason that we give something up for Lent is because you're supposed to give up something that's near and dear to you so that you will be tempted to violate what you've given up and you will overcome it. Does it sound difficult? Well, it can be. So I want to leave you with one little phrase that I have on a little wooden plaque in my kitchen. You can do all things through Christ. Amen. Was pretty good in terms of coughing. I guess the doctor, she knew what she was doing. Now is the time for our offering. <clears throat> if we have a non-contact method of offering, there is a plate in the back. If you have an offering that you wish to give, 
and have not already put in the plate, you can get up now, put it in the plate. When we are done, Wayne will bring it forward and we will sing the doxology number 95. We're changing it up from 94 to 95. If I even remember what 95 is. <laughs> even Connie's looking at us. Oh no. Did you feel that? The world tilted on its axis. Closing him, Jesus walked this lonesome valley, found in the faith we sing, number 2112.